Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And Alice and I are here in Canada filming today. Yes. And we want to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and tell you that we are glad that you can join us for this time in the Word. Bonjour. Bonjour. Although we're not in French Canada, but that's all right. <laughs> So we just we just are blessed that you can we can that we can be together in God's word as we continue on uh, in our study on the Sermon on the Mount, mm -hmm. and we're going to start today with "Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God." Matthew five eight. So you might want to open your Bible to that. If you take notes, get your pencil and paper, and let's get ready to go. But first, I'm going to ask Alice to ask God's blessing on our time together today. Hallelujah. Father, we just bless you. We praise you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for your precious word. Yes, we thank you for the time that you've given us to be able to share this word. And Lord, we ask that our hearts be prepared to receive whatever it is you have for us yes, today. Lord. We just bless you and praise you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I want to start by, as we often do, by giving you a dictionary definition of the word that we're looking at, so we have that common ground. Um, the Random House Dictionary says that pure is an adjective, and it means being free from anything of a different, inferior, or, or contaminating kind. Free from extraneous matter, unmodified by an admixture, free from foreign or inappropriate elements, free from moral taint or defilement. Okay. That's what it means to be pure. Now, that comes from the, the Greek word that's used here is catharsos, and that's often translated clean. That's gonna, I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in just a second. The Latin word is purus, which means pure, pure clean, unmixed, unmixed. Mm. So we're talking about, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about purity, we're going to talk about holiness, we're going to talk about sanctification, because that is all incorporated in this. And purity is, and holiness, you know, I have to make mention of the fact, because it's interesting that I read today, that the Bishop of London suggested to clergymen that they should grow long, big, bushy beards so that they would appear holy to the Muslims, because Muslims obviously connect that to holiness. You know what? It's not about what you look like on the it's inside. It's not the outward appearance. It's not the outward appearance. I know that man judges by outward appearance, but God searches the heart. And what people are looking for is what is real inside of us. And what is real inside of us is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. For we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And that is where the love of God has been poured. That's where the Word of God resides. Mm -hmm. So that's what's important in our lives, that people see our holiness, our purity, our cleanliness in the Spirit. Okay. And what comes out of our mouth is <clears throat> the abundance of our heart. Absolutely. Because Jesus said it's not what goes into a man that defiles him, but, but what, what comes, comes out. out. Okay? Amen. It says in Hebrews, Hebrews uh, 12, 14, it says, Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Hmm. So now, is this important? If you don't have that purity, if you don't have holiness, you're not going to see the Lord. That's... That's it. So let us be first, let's, let's agree on how serious this topic is, because it's obvious from these verses that the flip side of this coin is that unless you are pure, you'll not see God. And I promise you that's not what we want to have happen, not any way, shape, or form. Okay. Enough said, we'll come back, I promise you. In our study of uh, satisfaction, you know, just which we have just done. Mm -hmm. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. We talked about the fact that being full and satisfied did not come by adding things to our lives, but taking things from our lives that did not satisfy, getting rid of those, mm -hmm. right? 
In the same fashion, you don't become pure in heart now by what you add in your life as much as it's a matter of removing the impure things. We have to remove anything of a different, inferior, contaminating, or extraneous matter. Okay? It's taking stuff out, not what you can put in. Think of what Paul wrote to Timothy, Timothy 1, 1 Timothy 1, 5, when he said, The goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. Love that does not come from a pure heart is like a drink from polluted water to a thirsty man. It's, it's true. Uh, in Jeremiah 13 and 14, the Lord spoke to Jeremiah about the impurity of his people, how they had rejected his word and turned to other gods in their pride. God is telling the prophet of the calamities that life, their life is going to bring upon them as a result of that. All of this is going on in spite of the fact that the prophets of the time are telling the people that everything is all right. Everything is wonderful and that they will have lasting peace. To which the Lord said, and this is from the prophet Jeremiah, 14th chapter, the Lord said to me, the prophets are prophesying falsehood in my name. I have neither sent them nor commanded them nor spoken to them. They are prophesying to you a false vision, divination, futility, and deception of their own minds. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who are prophesying in my name, although it was not I who sent them, yet they keep saying there will be no sword or famine in this land. By sword and famine, those prophets shall meet their end. We need to understand the importance of of the purity, because God's word is holy, God's word is pure, of living that word, all right? So Jeremiah spoke to the Lord of how he loves the word and has not participated in the corrupt culture of the people. He said, I did not sit in the circle of the merrymakers, Jeremiah 15, 7, 17, and spoke of the pain he's experiencing as a result. The Lord then goes on to say to Jeremiah, Therefore, thus says the Lord, if you return, then I will restore you. Before me you will stand, and if you extract the precious from the worthless, you will become my spokesman. They, for their part, may turn to you, but as for you, you must not turn to them. You see, extract the precious from the worthless. You've got to get rid of what's worthless in your life. That's what purity is about. You know, if you have a clean, clean shirt, what, what makes it pure? If you get spots on it, if you get dirt on it, that's what makes impurity. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You remove that dirt. Right. You it's don't add wash. something to it, right? Mm -hmm. So we, like the prophet Jeremiah, have to keep what is precious and expel what's worthless. Mm -hmm. We need to be purged. Yes. Okay? Jesus purged. Yes, he did. Jesus purged. In 1 Corinthians one thirty, Paul writes... But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boasts, boast in the Lord. It is God who is doing the work. We just have to submit to him, humble ourselves and submit to him. Right? Jesus Christ, perfect holy, holiness and perfect purity, and yet... When impurities are in his body, they must be purged. What do you mean, impurities in his body? Well, in Revelation, we are the body of Christ. Is that not true? That's right. That's right. In, in, yeah. So, in Revelation chapter 3, dealing with the church of Laodicea, mm -hmm. listen to what, what God spoke to, Jer to John to pass on to us. To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The Amen, the faithful and true witness the beginning of the creation of God says this, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Revelation 3, 14 and 16. That's what it says. You know, the King James says spew. The New American Standard says spit. That's because we don't want to offend anybody 
uh, that we don't want to hurt anybody's sensibilities. Jesus said vomit because he meant vomit. Because that's what the whole body does. It's what the body is designed to do when there is something terrible in it. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, it says in Psalm 139. When there are impurities in our bodies, the best thing that can happen is your body purges, purges vomits them out. Lukewarm Christians are an impurity in the body of Christ, a defilement of the body of Christ, and a danger to the body of Christ. Jesus will, by design, violently expel them from his body, regardless of how ugly or uncomfortable that is, unless they turn to him and repent. You see, well, the beginning was good. Let's let's start with and recognizing the fact that we we came into new life with a pure heart. Yes. When you were born again, you were made a new creation in Christ Jesus. Pure you started with a pure heart, pure and holy. At the very moment that you were born again, the Lord took your old impure heart and gave you a new cleansed heart. That's what it says. He took that heart of stone and gave you a heart of flesh, right? That's right. Let me in Ezekiel thirty chapter thirty six it says this For I will take you from the nations gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. And then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all of your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statues, and you will be careful to observe all my ordinances." A fresh start. That's what it is. Hallelujah. But we came forth from death like Lazarus did. When he came came out of that tomb with new life. Hallelujah. He had been raised from the dead, just like we were when we were saved. He was alive on the inside, but you know what? He was still covered on the outside with the trappings of death. Mm -hmm. The bandages, the the burial clothes. And from there on, it became a battle of the outside against the inside, Mm -hmm. the flesh and the spirit, which the Apostle Paul says is still going on in our lives. This is the constant conflict. It's a daily battle. It says in Romans, Romans 12, 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Romans 12, 2. We need to be purged. We need to have that heart. You know, like David, they, they cried out, creating me a clean heart, right? Yes. Religion as practiced by the Pharisees does not have the power to do that. It doesn't have the power to cleanse you, even at their very best. The law can't cure sin. It can only point to sin, so we're conscious of it. But it says in Galatians, But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. So as Christ commented that the wrappings of death be removed from Lazarus when he came out of that tomb, right? Mm -hmm. But now faith has come and we are no longer under a tutor. For you're all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. You know, it says to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We we don't have the power to cleanse our own. We don't have the we don't have the power to make ourselves pure. We have the power to desire to be pure and surrender to Christ, who is you know to surrender to the Lord God, who is the Potter and we are the clay, so that He can do His work in us. We have right? to be available. Uh, absolutely, and we have to be surrendered to Him. Yes, that's what it means to call Him Lord. And if you don't call Him Lord, I don't know. You you better get together with him and have a conversation about that. Mm-hmm. You see, because the devil and his partner, you know he had a partner? Who's his partner? Your flesh. <laughs> the devil and his partner, our flesh, now want the old outside mm. to pollute yes. the new inside. Yes. That's the truth. Contaminate. So, you know, in, in Matthew chapter 5, it says, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery in his heart. Yes. Right? 
Because that's what God is searching. For. Because that's searching that's impurity. Heart. I hope I hope you know, especially in this world that we live in today, that adultery is sin. Yes. But it doesn't take adultery. Lust. Yeah. Just looking with lust. That's the sin. Okay. Religion concerned itself with outside actions, outer actions, but Christ with the inward. He was saying that what proceeds out of the mouth, that is what defiles a man. Just like I said a moment ago, right? From, for from within of the heart, man, from the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these things that proceed from within defile the man. Well, you know, James said that if we could control our tongue, we'd be perfect. Yes. All right? So it's so important that, that you do that. But I want to talk about something, because I know I've met a lot of, in, in, particularly in counseling, I meet a lot of people that get guilt tr trips put on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay? Yes. Jesus said if you look at a woman with lust, that's not, not just looking at a woman. Okay? Anything. Well, I mean, but you look at a woman, lots of times, that, that, there's no sin in that. No. Okay? And I like to use the example of Car. cars. Yes. Because that is less troublesome to the flesh, to the religious person. Yes. But here's a fact. You know, if I, I like, I've always, I've owned a number of sports cars. I've always liked cars, right? I don't have a passion for them anymore, but I promise you that I did it one time. And yet, if we're driving along and I see a Ferrari pull up alongside of me, or an F-Type Jaguar, you know, I look at it, I think, they're, they're, that's a beautiful piece of work. It really is. There's no sin in that. There's no sin in me looking at a Ferrari or a Jaguar and liking it. There's nothing wrong with that. The problem becomes, when I like it, I have to be careful that I don't linger on it. Because when you linger on that thing, all of a sudden, you start to picture yourself in it. Drive you start to think, whoa, whoa, whoa. Yeah. I, how would I look if I was driving that? Mm -hmm. So when you linger on it, that grows in you, and that turns to lust. So you have this process mm -hmm. of you look, you like, you linger, you lust. So what do you have to do? You can look at something and like it, cut it short, that's all. Because we're called to fix our eyes on Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. Don't, don't be trapped into to fixing your eyes on something other than Him, right? Take thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ and don't give the devil an opportunity. It says, you know, in 2 Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 2, 2, 2, 2, 22. Now flee from youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. That's where you call on the Lord, from a pure heart. Now, the, the opposite of that, in Revelation chapter 9, it talks about, talking about people who don't surrender to the Lord. It says, they did not repent of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their immorality, nor of their thefts. Revelation 9, 21. Now, I said pornography, didn't I? Or sorceries. That word sorceries in the Greek is pharmakia. That's drugs. You know, and it's not just sorcery. That's because drugs are always, we're always used, still the are. And, yeah. In sorcery. Yeah. But the simple fact of the matter is it says drugs. Yeah. And in spite of what they may have thought back in the, when they were writing the King James and didn't have such a massive problem, they put it down as sorcery. We have a drug problem today yes, that, is, that boggles yes. the mind. And the Word of God says that those people not surrendered to Christ, they're not going to repent of their drugs. And the word, you know, the word immorality, come, the Greek word is porneia. All right? The that's the word, that's pornography. Now, pornography is, what do you, you know, in 1973, the Supreme Court, in a case called Miller versus California. Justice Berger, he's of the United States Supreme Court I'm talking about, mm -hmm. which is not supreme by the way, mm -hmm. announced the second definition of obscenity, the majority position of the court, and the definition which more or less is still in effect today. It is as follows. 
whether the average person applying contemporary community standards would find that that work, taken as a whole, appeals to Purian interest. It was Justice Potter Stewart who said that while he might not be able to define pornography, he'd sure recognize it when he saw it, okay? <clears throat> so by law then, in the United States, pornography is determined by what is acceptable to men, to the community. Mm -hmm. You know what? Community standards. Community standards. Pornography is what is not acceptable to God. So there's a lot more pornography out there than you might imagine. Because there's a lot of stuff that has become acceptable to man, even those who are inside the church, that I promise you is not acceptable to God. And we need to be purified of that. We need to purge ourselves and purge the church of those things. Because he holds us to a higher standard. He holds us to the standard. Right. Okay? The world simply doesn't have standards. Yeah. And what they say is the standard today will be different five Jeez. minutes from now, and yeah. it'll be different ten minutes, and it'll never, never hit the nail on the head. It's hard to look anywhere in the world and not see it, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's true today, but I want you to think what Isaiah said 2700, over 2,700 years ago. The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants, for they transgressed laws, violated statutes, and broke the everlasting covenant. Mm. Polluted, that's the word that's used, and that's the word that it means. You see, sin's a pollution. Yes. We, you can talk about all this, the, the stuff you want, carbon dioxide and carbon emissions, and, but the simple fact of the matter is there is no pollutant like sin. <clears throat> we need to be purified. We need to be, we're supposed to be the air freshener. We're bringing the knowledge of the presence of Christ Jesus, that fragrant aroma, into every place to, get, to bring some freshness to that and, right. the, and the pollution of the world will be purged by fire. Fire. Fire, which is holiness. Because that's where holiness comes from. That's right. You know, Job said that, I know that when I have been tried, I shall come forth as fine gold. Yes. There is a purifying process in fire. Yes. The way gold was processed, and what he was talking about, is they heat, they superheat gold. And what happens is the impurities float to the top, to the surface, so they where they can be, be scraped off. Mm -hmm. That's how you purify gold, by fire. That's not a, <coughs> we get purified. Holy fire. <clears throat> holy fire. We need holy fire in our lives yes. to purify us. It was the Spirit who gave us a new and pure heart. And when we fall short and defile it, we must, like David, cry out to the Lord in repentant surrender and trust in His ability to purify us. After David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and caused the death of her husband, Uriah. I mean, how much worse can you get than that, right? And by the way, our God doesn't try and hide that from us. He doesn't try and pretty the picture. No. We got the truth. We got the straight story here. But David, no cover was, up. David was confronted by the prophet Nathan, right? And brought the word of God in the person of Nathan the prophet. It's in 2 Samuel, right? Yes. And as Paul wrote to Timothy, that word is profitable for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. David responded to God's loving discipline with a heartfelt cry of repentance, the tool that is provided by the Lord. Catharsis for purification. All right? It, it, it rings with beauty throughout the ages. I let me just, I'm going to read a long psalm, but I want you to hear this, okay? I'm going to read Psalm 51, verses 1 to 19. Oh, that's a beautiful yes. Be gracious. This is, this is David, mm. right? A sinner like us, but with a heart after God, a man after God's own heart. Yes. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire the truth in the innermost being and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Purify me with hyssop, 
and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, lest the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. Deliver me from blood guiltness, O God, the God of my salvation. Then my tongue will joyfully sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips that my mouth may declare your praise. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You're not pleased, pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. By your favor, do good to Zion. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then young bulls will be offered on your altar. Hallelujah. To wash there in that verse, by the way, verse 2, comes from that same word. Well, it comes from the word that means to be kind of trampled on, to, when you, like you rub things to clean them. Well, do that, Lord. Promise. David prayed, turn your face from my sins, O Lord. You know what? He was righteous. And the effective prayer of a righteous man availeth much. God the Father answered that prayer of David and turned his face from David's sin. You know when? When Jesus hung on a cross. Jesus? Well, it says, he who knew no sin became sin for our sake. It was David's sin that was nailed to the cross. It was my sin that was nailed to the cross and your sin that was nailed to that cross. And God the Father answered David's prayer and turned his face away. And Christ cried out in a spiritual agony that we'll never understand. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because for a moment in time, he turned his face from Jesus Christ in answer to a prayer by David to be made clean. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, I'm just going to give you something to think about until next time. Remember in our def definition of pure, it said, it talked about ex extraneous things. That's the things that don't, they don't seem bad. They're just extra. They're unnecessary. And they are not part of God's purpose in our lives. The sermon of, of Jesus is, as I said at the beginning, radical, but it's consistent. It says in James 4.4, 4, You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. We have to turn in repentance. We have to turn and fix our eyes on the only one who can redeem us, cleanse us from our sin, Jesus Christ. And we will see God. So, Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you have a plan, that you have a way, that you have a work in us, that we would see you in purity and holiness, in our purity and holiness, because you have cleansed us and washed us clean. Lord, give us a burning desire, a passion, Lord God, to be cleansed from the world and the things of the world, that we might present ourselves to you pure and holy. We praise you and thank you for the work that you're doing in our lives, Lord God. And we look forward to that day, not far off, I pray that we see you face to face in Jesus' precious name. Well, God bless you and goodbye. Till next time. Bye-bye. So I cherish that old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay Oh,